Hey everyone, welcome back to the pod. I'm Jameson. In a few minutes, Avery will be joining me while we talk with maker Evan Howard. This is going to be a sweet episode, and I can't wait for you to hear it, but I want to give you a few updates first. Now, first of all, who is Evan Howard and why do you care about listening to him? It's a great question. Let me dive in a little bit. Many of us love the cottage industry because of the stories and the people that are behind the gear. They're not faceless companies that we're buying from. They're people, stories, and families that we're buying into. Terra Rosa Gear, their founder and owner, Evan Howard, is a really cool story that we've been fortunate enough to know for a long time. The story revolves around a mad scientist in his workshop doing things that he's passionate about. Evan makes gear that brings people joy, uses colors that reflect the earth, and makes designs that make you question what functional is or isn't. You'll hear about the DIY world in Australia, how RBTR has helped Terra Rosa gear grow, the private workshops that Evan runs, as well as his crazy one-off projects, and a new design partnership that he's cultivated just this past year. There's a lot of cool stuff, so stay tuned for that in just a minute. But first, two other updates. First of all, you've heard us mention it several times, but we're going to AT Trail Days in May. This event is going to be awesome. There's a lot of cool makers coming to the show in general, but also we're going to be hosting eight really cool makers, four of which will be in person. So if you want to meet Almonds Wright, National Pack, UGQ, and people from Hightail, then you can see them and their gear all in our booth there. We're going to be giving away a free wallet kit. We're going to be selling exclusive items that you haven't seen before, as well as giving away some really cool gear from these companies and others. So if you want to have a super rad time, talk to other makers as well as companies, then come see us at AT Trail Days, May 18th to 20th. Also, as always, we're releasing new products soon. We've got new notions and tools coming up very, very soon. Keep an eye on that new tab on our site. All right, enjoy the episode. Hey, Evan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. This is quite the video call, being that you're in Australia and we're in North Carolina, but we're super excited to chat with you. So to kick us off, tell us about who Evan is when you're not making gear. Oh, sure. Well, um, yeah, first off, uh, yeah, I'm coming here from Melbourne, which is um, the unceded Wurundjeri country. Uh, so, yeah, I just uh, always give a shout out to that sort of stuff here. And, uh, yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place down here. But uh, myself, um, I'm now a father, so that's really changed things uh, in the last year. Uh, so outside of building gear and thinking about gear and using gear and destroying gear and building gear and all sorts of gear, it's, it's uh, yeah, just all about fatherhood hood really um and that's uh, yeah that's something that's really changed perspectives for me and all that and I, I really love that but um i think everything else really is pretty self-explanatory like i love being outside it's where i spend as much time as i can um nature and the environment and all of those sort of things are um things i'm really passionate about and um it, australia and melbourne and this area around here i'm, I'm spoilt for for a lot of choice on what i get to do yeah how did your MYO journey begin? Like people know of Terra Rosa, the company now, but you haven't always been a company. Where did Evan start when you were making gear? At yeah, the golly. I, I, if you go way back, um, like obviously my, my accent probably betrays me. I grew up in Canada um, and then I have lived in Australia for my entire adult life pretty much, but enough time to get my accent uh, sorted out. Um, so yeah, I, I actually learned in Canada to sew in, in school. It was just a, a thing that we did. And um you know, we had an opportunity to uh, uh, take a sewing class or, or take, um, you know, like the wood classes and metalworks and stuff like that. And I had already done my metalwork and was, was happy with, with what I did, but that passion wasn't quite there. And then I started sewing. Um, and, and to be completely honest, the passion wasn't there either. It was just, you know, whatever, 15-year-old Evan just running a old Janome machine. But what that did was instill me with the knowledge of, this is a bobbin, this is a bobbin case, this is, you know, what's happening, you have a, you know, a circular motion being transferred through machinery to become a reciprocal up and down motion, and it's like, wow, this is kind of neat, and then didn't touch a sewing machine again until I was um, in my early 20s, really, uh, and then that's when I started to um, really go into the, the MYOG stuff, and that, that would have been probably in somewhere around 2007, 2008, really started getting serious about um, about making gear and it was really quite an exciting time and 
um, yeah, just kind of grabbed an old singer, uh, a two hundred one k. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people listening to this would probably know what that machine is, or it's it's if you don't, it's the old singer. It's that black singer that's sleek and it's a, it's a beautiful machine, engineered well. Mine was built in nineteen fifty six, so it was uh, it was older than my my mom. Uh, and yeah, it, that that thing still goes. I still have it in the workshop. I don't do too much on it, of course. Now it's very slow compared to what the industrials that I have now are capable of. But um, yeah, great machine, and it was capable of doing pretty much anything that I asked of it uh, until we started getting you know into those heavier materials and thicker leathers, and and as you start to experiment on multiple seams coming into one another, and then all of a sudden the needles are going everywhere and all that sort of thing. And yeah. And, that kind of initiated my only rule in the workshop is that uh, you wear safety glasses when you sew. Because, uh, yeah, when, when those machines uh, break a needle, uh, sometimes it doesn't just break. It'll explode, right? You can feel those little pieces come up past your face and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of my, my little story in a nutshell with that sort of stuff. Evan, so for people that follow you on Instagram, uh, you have like this – and I, I hope I put this uh, respect enough because it, it, with all due respect, you have like this incredible like mad scientist energy about what you create where there's never uh, there's never a dull moment. You have hilarious videos like you repelling a sewing machine down a staircase. Um, you have all this amazing gear that you do like this patchwork stuff, which we'll get into later. But we talk a lot about kind of like the inspiration that people have to making. Like we, we, we talk about like how a lot of us were like Lego kids growing up. Like we're always like building stuff, like eventually to become MYOGers. What about all this? I kind of preface to say like, what about your younger life? Do you remember? Do you think led you to be like a gear maker now? Wow. Um, well, thanks for the compliment. First of all, uh, yeah. Mad scientist. I love that. Um, it, yeah. If th there's everything everywhere, like, uh, like I'm just looking around here, and like I framed this shot very well for the uh, the listeners that are actually watching video. But the, the rest of the floor, you can't see. I've got piles, everything, projects over here, an idea over here. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty fun. But yeah, little little young Evan, um, when when I wasn't causing trouble, um, which was wasn't that often, you know, defined trouble as well, right? So you know, I had a lot of free time um, during summers and that sort of thing, and outside of school and. You know, school and I didn't didn't really um, get along too well, especially in the later years. Uh, so self-taught sort of things was was really there, and that, all of that sort of initiative, I think, yeah, came from um, you know just going out and doing doing stuff as as a kid. So yeah, I had um, Lego and Connects, and you know, you enjoyed building, um, but also uh, like we're not we're not how do you say it like. Uh, I don't have a ton of money, um, so I wasn't always just able to go and buy what I wanted to use. So that's cool. I would just then modify or um, try and make something from scratch, um, and and that's that's great. I, and I still love to do that. If if you don't need to buy it new, then you can, you know, upcycle it or make it from something else. So yeah, as a, as a little kid, you know, hammer and nails and uh, and the old wood pile or or, or pallets or anything was. You know, it was just everything was a blank canvas, and um, that, those skills that came quite quickly were were fun. What, what my, one of my favorite stories is, um, uh, well, I guess the Australians don't really know, but you know the GTs for sliding on snow. There's two skis, a seat in the middle, and then there's a ski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're they're awesome. Um, so those, I just wanted to make that thing go faster, uh, so like you could make it lighter and. So I, I ended up bending little pieces so that the edges of the plastic skis would, would grip more and there'd be less friction but more grip, um, if that makes any sense, to allow for sliding. And, yeah, I'd yep. just get out there with an angle grinder and modify the, the plastic ski and little 10-year-old Evan would just go ripping down the, uh, down the hill as fast <laughs> as I can. So it, You're talking about like the old like the, like the old sleds, like the, like the almost like radio – flyer sled um, I, deal, I know right? stiga out of finland was making them and i had like i had a brett okay. hall one the hockey player <laughs> no from the st yeah. louis blues <laughs> so i had i had that one for a little while i had an old plastic red one which we left out overnight one night and it was like minus 40 or something and then of course in the morning no school because it was too cold but like awesome so now let's go play in the snow and that thing was frozen solid and i hit one jump and the entire thing just shattered just that 
I, I don't know, <laughs> some sort of junky polyethylene or something like that. And it was just past its freeze point and probably been left out in the sun for eight summers before too. So yeah, that thing, that thing has gone. Anyway, you got me reminiscing now about <laughs> all sorts of fun things. <laughs> Speaking of you being a kid, um, you also just recently mentioned that you became a dad. Yeah. Um, so congratulations, oh, and she's, Lance sent me a photo yesterday of her, and she's just adorable, yeah, but do you have any tips on, um, any tips for new parents on adventuring with little ones? Wow, um, yeah, I, I'm certainly not, uh, not nearly an expert or even, uh, super knowledgeable on that, I'm, I'm still learning, um, heaps, um, uh, she's little, little Gwendolyn, she's teaching me something new about every five minutes, and, it's it's a great journey, but um, yeah, I had her in the pack raft when she was about three and a half weeks old. We went for uh, went for a camp overnight and just had some fun like that, and and that was a very easy time because she she wasn't really doing anything other than just uh, you know feeding and sleeping and kind of moving around, you know, moving her arms, and um, and that was you know what a what a great time. Now that she's um you know crawling around and about to start walking and all that sort of thing, um, and you know there's a schedule with her naps and all that, so we just work around our adventures to to that, but. There's a walk every morning, and we go out and play in the woods. And um, I, I'm I live here in Melbourne, just up near the um, the Plenty River, which is a beautiful uh, river that comes um, down from the north there. And so we go down and like look at the trees, and like here's some eucalyptus, and she loves to touch and get all the tactile stuff. But but in terms of like actual techniques or anything like that, I I'm sur- I'm still learning. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's great fun. But uh, certainly one of the biggest things that, that she's uh, given me is a new perspective on, on risk, um, you know, because before it's like, whatever, climb this mountain or, you know, descend this waterfall, single rope, maybe no backup, whatever you need, just go. Um, and yeah, that's certainly, uh, certainly a new change for me is, uh, is thinking more about um, the, the, the dire consequences in moments that, uh, that have like, you know, a huge objective risks that uh, I probably wouldn't. Uh, except now in certain situations so yeah what a time you've mentioned some of the sports that you do if you want to call them that but uh you're a mountaineer uh uh, you mentioned uh, rafting i've seen you post about bikes on your instagram channel what other endeavors or types of activities do you like to do and do you make your wow yeah i well I, i love any sort of outdoor adventure is is great fun and and adventure is all relative for some people you know uh what what i would do is hardly an adventure because they're you know wicked crazy and then for some people just going down to the park might be their adventure and, and that's great but uh for me personally yeah my i love being on the ropes um uh in the mountains um and descending uh so australia because it doesn't have huge tall mountains like it does like canada does um the the canyoning um is great and um yeah there's a great little canyoning community here uh, with some guidebooks uh, written by my friends that have come out and they, they've done a great job in really opening up um the ideas uh that that are here um because we yeah it's it's beautiful and all sorts of things but melbourne as well is um uh, we're quite we're in quite a, a flat hilly country down here uh, in Melbourne so we don't have great grand mountains like I was just saying but there's lots of beautiful beautiful places amazing hills uh, and there's lots of gravel roads around so biking and bike packing uh, the community here is the best I've ever seen um, it's just the people in it are, are fantastic folks so there's lots of bike packing lots of road riding lots of gravel riding um, lots of mountain biking um, those are all great. I, I prefer myself just like a little adventure on gravel, uh, and it's usually doing something else. So whenever I'm riding a bike, usually something else is attached to it, like the raft or maybe my skis or something, uh, and off we're going to to kind of do something else. But um, let's see what else is uh, is kicking around. Well, it's, yeah, surfing is one that I probably haven't touched on very much, uh, and being in Australia, that's probably pretty silly. Uh, but yeah, if I ever had a chance, mountains or water, uh, or mountains or ocean, I'd just change. For me, it's a hundred percent mountains, pretty much every time. Um, so yeah, if someone someone else is uh, want to fight me for that one, then <laughs> go for it. <laughs> do you have? I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you have a story that you would like to share about a time where you took some MYOG stuff on an adventure or into the mountains? Um, just about something. I mean, I I guess I should 
kind of clarify, for a lot of people, we, we a lot of us take our MYOG stuff into the mountains. And um, to reiterate what you said, there's no different, um, you know, whatever your adventure is, that's amazing. No matter how consequential or not that might feel to you, it's always great to get out wherever you are. But I don't think very many people are familiar with the feeling of taking MYOG stuff into high alpine or to like high angle places. <laughs> um, so for people that aren't familiar with that, can you share kind of just like a, a fun story or maybe one where you had a, like a failure of some sort or something that'd be really interesting for most people that aren't used to being on ropes, trusting something that they made to keep you alive? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I haven't made any harnesses or load bearing things like that. Um, so when I'm on the ropes, those are all, uh, you know, straight up, uh, you know, uh, proper canyoning ropes and it's a harness that, uh, that I've trusted with my life. But yeah, definitely have the, like my packs uh, will be on the can. I've made all the canyoning bags. Um, and then in terms of uh, failures, uh, nothing that I've made on myself for life-threatening kind of situation, which is very good. It's uh, the R&D and uh, testing processes are coming out perfectly there. Um, but yeah, there's always the classic like, oh, my tarp flew over in the middle of the night and I was too lazy to get out. And it's like, well, uh, you know, I've got five more hours of wind, maybe three more hours of rain. I'll wait this one out in the, in the, in the, in the sleeping cover and it'll be fine. I'll dry off. Um, and then I use a lot of synthetic materials. Uh, anyway, I don't really work too much with down um, at the or commercially. I don't really work too much with down, um, just because of everything that I do has so much water involved. So in, in, when there's any sort of failure like that, um, but so yeah, to answer your uh, your question exactly, a, a proper story um, of failure on one. Let me let me just think, and I'll, I'll I'll interrupt and come back to it when I when it, when I remember. How about that? That's perfect. Um, I know that you are one of our longer customers and that you've been using Ripstop by the Roll, I think, since 2013. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how Ripstop has helped you grow your business, grow your business with support and resources. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I, it would have been, yeah, 2012, 2013. Um, I think we started getting those. Um, uh, how did like where did I can't even remember where I first saw it because that may have been Instagram sort of stuff because I was I just joined Instagram about 2012 um, and anyway however I first heard of it it was like wow this this sounds really cool and I can still remember talking to Kyle on the phone in my living room chatting materials and then like how, what what can you get me I've got like twenty five dollars Australian and maybe like a half pack of gum or something like what do you got. And it's like, oh, yeah, I've got some still nylon. And, like, this is still before the still poly and stuff had really uh, hit hit the ground running. Um, so, yeah, it's you know, some good memories from from way back in those OG days there. Um, and then as, as I progressed through, and by 2014, 2015, I made that transition into working Terrarosa gear full time. Um, and then that's where things really started to, to snowball. And I was able to buy... Um, uh, a, a roll or two at a time. I'm still not buying for anyone here that, that thinks we're Terros gear is massive. Like my minimum order quantities are still nowhere near being able to go anywhere uh, from China or anything from like the Asian origin materials. And that's where Ripstop uh, was really the, the difference for me because I could order a half a roll or something stupid. Like, you know, I need 78 meters for this project or, or yards, of course, sorry, folks. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that that sort of um, uh, how would you say it there? So I just lost my words. That that sort of access to the materials in the exact quantities I've needed, um, without having to overshoot and then have five years worth of material just sitting here as I slowly work through. All of that was just vital for 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 my very small business. And again, small business doesn't even describe it right. Like we're talking micro business here. Um, like that, that's kind of, you know, a better description of what a lot of, I think us makers as well are. Um, and there's still, and it, 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 this is an interesting idea if I can digress for a moment, but like, uh, there is some people who are still considered to be in the cottage industry. Uh, sorry, I wouldn't say people, there is some companies that are considered to be cottage industry. And I think they're very inspiring and uh, they're very pushing the limits. But if you have a hundred employees, like you, that's that's starting to get up into uh, maybe not so much cottage industry as a, in a sense, even though their identity might be there, and that's great. Um, so this certainly isn't a critique on on those companies. I think we all probably know who they they are, um, but it's certainly like 
if we come up in the same discussion, it's it's very fascinating going like, oh, I remember like you know they're they they've got 155 employees in a really cool warehouse. Like, I've got a back room and and three people who contract me who are my friends. Um, so yeah, it's like it's uh it, it's a cool world. And um, again, like that's certainly not a, a complaint or a critique. It's just the the two scales I think of which we see here. And yeah, Ripstop has really allowed me to then get into that sort of discussion to be in in with these really cool makers and these really cool companies that um uh you know have really progressed because yeah like we go, if we go back again to 20 2013 2014 the cottage industry was was um well a very different place like instagram was in its early days and all of these social medias that everybody was using to uh, promote their businesses and stuff like uh you know which are vital uh were, were still in their infancy so it was a really really cool time and so i took a lot of inspiration from um from what i saw happening in the states with like um you know jacks are better and ed spear uh on his hammocks and stuff uh who else could we even like throw into it uh there was some really cool ones um of course like zed packs was kicking around and um uh who else was there i think this is before hyperlight and before some of those other really cool ones like yeah it was it was a cool time so i saw that and was like well how how can how how would i make that happen here in australia um, and yeah, Ripstop uh, really stepped up, uh, and it was really a cool thing to see over the month by month, the business just continue to grow more materials be available. And as these materials are more and readily available to myself, my creativity could really flourish because I could then get something like this, try that, realize that that's not going to work, but that would, and, um, yeah, just really, really progress. So yeah, sorry, that was probably quite a long winded answer on it, but, uh, uh, Ripstop by the role is you know, completely vital. And now the the B two B the the business to business stuff that uh, that I've been working with Lance um, you know that's that's amazing and Lance does a great job because he um, as we formed a friendship and stuff as well so I, I just flick him messages and uh, you know keep the language under control and stuff but <laughs> it's, it's, yeah it's good fun and it's really it's been a neat journey to see where Ripstop has come from and where it's going and where it's continuing to go as you say you're moving into the, the new warehouse in April Fool's Day and um, and uh, yeah, and then where how my business has progressed to to you know allow me to work full time on something that I really really love to do uh, and, uh, and and keep it pushing forward and surviving. So I'm going to put you on the spot here again, yeah. Kevin, which uh, apparently is the theme of the day. Norm normally, we try to like send people and give them some preparation for the outline, and then this week. I got really busy and I kind of just threw you under the be the bus on accident oh. Evan, and just like completely forgot to give you all the hard love questions. Love it, love it. All right. <laughs> but um, so you've been around for a while and you even mentioned something that a lot of people aren't familiar with in terms of um, Sil Poly and the Sil Nylon. Like there was not, you didn't always have options to both, uh, right? Some of these are kind of fairly new milestones in the fabric and MYOG world. So in your own world, in your own mind, as, as you've seen the fabric world, progress what have been some of the biggest milestones for fabrics and product offerings that have come out that are now available by the half yard basically for people where before like in 2013 you had very very limited access we had limited access and we were trying to source yeah. them so like what have what have been some of the biggest milestones since yeah then? interesting okay i i think um the cuban back then cuban uh which is now dcf dyneema uh i think when that became available i think that that was that for me was was huge because like i still have my first tarp that i made out of that stuff which is going really well there's there, i've put huge repairs on it because i'm always putting holes in it and whatever um you know because i have to treat it badly see where i can make that fail point but certainly i think um access to the the dcf uh would have been a huge one and that i'm trying to remember now that would have been pr pretty early like that would have been in the 2013 14s and then obviously it's changed its name as the companies change hands and stuff like that but um then for me the access to the recycled polys was great i think uh, if i if i remember correctly the sil poly v1 um did, it had some issues i think some of the tensile strength or something might have been a little bit off i'm sorry if i am incorrect on that we can put a hyphen or um an asterisk on that one but uh, the v2 stuff amazing i love working with the the sil polys and the the recycled stuff i've got it sitting right here behind me there we go that's how quickly i have access to it it's just right on the shelf there we go um and i i, I love that idea and i think 
the the recycled stuff was was a big step for me. I think that that was something that was very important because um, you know we're, when we start looking into things, and we don't need to go too deeply into this because uh, it's a it's a continuing discussion, of course. But like carbon footprint with gear, um, everything's made with a petroleum based material and all of that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's it's all all that. So having again just having access to that recycled stuff was was a great. Um, step forward um, and then I think the, the latest big step is um, f- shout out to challenge uh, the sailcloth I think the ultras are just incredible uh, I think that that's a really neat material uh, and a really incredible price to strength um, or, or maybe like just straight up value uh, it is expensive but that, that you're making heirloom items now that are going to last for years and like you know hopefully Gwendolyn's wearing some of these backpacks that I'm making today after I've flogged them for you know however long and then she can put them on and it's yeah and those memories and those all of that sort of stuff is captured into uh into an item so you know it's a great debate whether upcycling and recycling or making something new that will last forever and where where on the balance scale do those two things and can you combine them and yeah, it's a whole great little thought process on, on all of that sort of stuff. You mentioned uh, treating your DCF tarp badly <laughs> to test it out. Let's talk about some of your products. So you're a designer of a lot of different stuff. Um, I guess probably part of this question is asking what exactly do you make? You're not exactly a pack company, not exactly a quilt company or a shelter company. Um so actually, let's just start with that question. What what do you make, or like how how broad is it? Yeah, it it is very broad. Um, yeah, golly, I started with like tarps and shelters, admittedly because like it, honestly they're easy to make with you know with an asterisk. Go out and have a try. There's ways to perfect it that become a lot more difficult. But in terms of getting yourself a basic square tarp, it's a great project. It's really rewarding. And there's nothing like going out with your tarp and sleeping under your tarp for the first time. You hear the rain, you're dry, the rain's beating down on your tarp that you made. Yeah, it's pretty special. So um, yeah, that that's all 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 really cool. So I started with 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 shelters with the tarps, and and then it just it just kept going. And maybe that mad scientist um, idea is like I you know I have a hard time just sitting with one thing um, before I bing off to the other thing. Uh, and then that brings off to two more things. So, uh, you know, so much of it is just keeping my mind and my projects under control and, and focused. So I just kind of started again. So I started with the tarps, then went and then it was like, well, what do I need next? I need a quilt. Um, what how what's the best and easiest and coolest way to build a quilt? Well, the synthetics with this material at the time, whatever it was, um, you know, probably, probably like a 20 denier nylon or something. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's then just continued my love from that, that developed and the skills that started to come along, um, were like, wow, this is, this is so much fun. And my love of the sewing machine, um, started to increase. And then as my knowledge of the sewing machine increased, all of a sudden it broadened and I realized that there's so many different types of sewing machines. Uh, and now like sitting in my workshop here within three meters of me I've got a double needle lightweight single needle lightweight two bar tackers cylinder arm heavyweight double needle post bed heavyweight um, and then I've got two machines at home for when I work at home with Gwendolyn um, and the they all do something different so that's really why I've never ended up pigeonholing myself in one specific area because one I love building everything um, and two, I now have a machine that can build everything. Now I won't production line heaps of runs. So I won't build like a hundred of one thing all at once. Um, I'll build, you know, one or two, maybe three or something like that at a time. And, and, uh, yeah, work, work through those sort of things. But also in terms of things I built, I haven't always, or I don't always just build outdoor gear as well. I'll take, um, really cool. Uh, contracts with a lot of um, some like government uh, or and some of the agencies that are really neat like the Antarctic Division or um, uh, the CSIRO which is the um, science agency here in Australia so I've built their satellite covers for the receivers um, so I'll, yeah they, those blasting off things into space and re- taking back the signals and uh, and yeah I get to build the um, uh, 
uh, emergency shelters for for down in uh, in Antarctica. So all the scientists, when they're out there doing their um, their their science and all their vital data collection, uh, they get to go into the into the bothy shelters that I make, uh, which is really really cool. Um, so yeah, it's again I sort of kind of pointing at it. So I have make something like that, and then I make something like that on the other side. And the weights and materials um, are not uh, an issue either. So I've got the heavyweight machines, as I mentioned, so like canvas. And, um, big heavy corduras, uh, like epically strong stuff. It's really cool. L using needles that are size 24, and that's about as big as I think my machines will get. But like, you know, these are these are nails. You're sewing with nails now. It's really cool. Yeah, heaps of fun. Um, so yeah, so again, that's yeah, wild. maybe little, again. You make some really cool yeah, stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like just so much fun to keep you on your toes. What what are we building today? Oh, cool. It's you know some bike bags, and then oh, cool. This one's a, yeah, that's another satellite cover or whatever. Like yeah, it's it's pretty fun. So I'm gonna give you maybe an, an example, and you tell us how it works. And you kind of hinted on it there, but you built so much stuff. You have I'm, the the R and D must be pretty all over the place. I mean, th there's a few principles of making gear that you'll that I'm sure will go you know, principles of construction and how to make good gear, but let's just walk us through the process of designing a piece of gear from a concept to when you finally send it out. How do you fine tune something, especially when you're working as broadly as satellite covers to bike bags? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That, um, very good question because it will be, it'll be project to project um, with that sort of thing, definitely. But um, say, say it's like, uh, well, if you're not reinventing the wheel, uh, it'll just be, you know, imagining that space uh, and then how do you fill that space with the material? How do you keep it, one, safe, uh, effective, effective use of the material and effective use of the space? Uh, and then how can you put that together? So I kind of like in my mind, uh, just like visualize that in, in three dimensions. And then I might sketch up the idea, uh, obviously not to scale, just a rough sketch, just to see if I can transfer that what's in my mind onto a 2D surface. Then if I need to, I'll CAD it up. Um, but a lot of times I might even skip CAD and just go straight into a prototype. And then I literally have what I'm building in front of me. And then you can kind of start to tailor what you're seeing and pull things together, take things apart, re-sew it. Um, or you might not even be sewing it. Maybe it's just clipping in the moment, something along those sort of lines. Um, and that would be for, uh, like, say, a bike bag or something where you know the space. Like, oh, like uh, for example, I've got some feed bags that I've been working on. So I know what kind of space I'm limited to uh, this kind of this high, this wide. So how can I then make something beautiful? And another fun part of uh, design is obviously for how effective and um, uh, how useful that item is. But it, for me, it's also like how, how beautiful now can you make it? Um, is the, and, and how can you make something uh, different um, and inspiring? Because I, I think um, for Instagram and Facebook and all of these amazing um social media that that aid our businesses to, to to no end really what it also does is it allows those ideas to get out there and then very quickly a cool idea will um kind of permeate through everything and then all of a sudden to me some a lot of things start looking the same and it's like that's cool and so when we reach that little bottleneck of everything looking the same I, what i keep thinking about is how can we like get through that bottleneck and start spreading everything out again looking to do something a little bit different over here or can we take it that direction and it will still work um, with, you know, without losing any sort of, without it losing any sort of function on, on the item. Um, and then in terms of something like completely custom, um, that that's, can be where it gets really fun. Cause like say a customer might come with an idea on a shelter or um, some, some wild one, like let's have the sleeping cover and a tent all built into one. So it could be an insulated tent and then also a, like a, a sleeping bag at the same time when I don't want to set up. It's like, yeah, some really neat ideas. Like they could end in complete failure as well. Um, but, I'll, you know, if, we, if it's for a customer, you work with them and we, with good communication, you have all sorts of ideas uh, and those options open. So they understand that this could fail miserably. Um, but with the heaps of experience, um, heaps of experience on the machines. Yeah, you can start to see how things can come together. Uh, and then I think what's so vital and what I love to do is so much of the gear and any, anything that I sell is usually I've used until destruction anyway. Um, if it's custom, I'll just say like, look, I'm not sure what that's, how that's going to react when the temperature drops overnight and you have some high humidity and like, well, I'm not sure if the dew point's going to sit inside it or just outside it. So you might get condensation. 
uh, it might happen on the outside, but it might, could happen on the inside, depending on all sorts of, you know, the atmospheric temperatures and all these variables that we have absolutely no control of. And now we're just back into the, you know, the classic sleeping bag tent design sort of thing of like, how, how do we deal with moisture and how do we deal with, uh, you know, all of these sort of things that we have no control over. So yeah, that, that process is a, is a lot of fun and it can be a long one as well. Since you make so many different types of gear, you also uh, specialize, or I want to say specialize in scrap projects because you definitely do more than the average person, including the the scrap quilt that you donated for the hang con that was um, raffled off. Yeah, that um, was awesome. But can you talk about your process for? making a piece of gear out of scraps and what that looks like yeah the process um it starts with um other projects as you're cutting cutting out the pattern <laughs> um all of a sudden you're like oh to make best use of that material in that way like i might need to cut something that's not on the bias of the material um the bias for listeners who might not be familiar is where it stretches on the uh the north west uh sorry north south east west access the, the west of the loft of, uh, of the fabric um so i might not be able to have that piece of the pattern cut on that angle it's got to be straight uh and then that might then obviously allow for a bit of wastage on that piece of material so that piece of material is not going to go into the bin it's not going to end up you know going to landfill it, it immediately just gets put into another box of scraps usually i've got them uh, uh, uh organized into like lightweight ultra lightweight heavyweight midweight whatever uh and then when a project comes up where someone's like oh can i have it in recycled upcycled scraps like, perfect that's going to be some midweight grab that box out just start slapping those pieces together and um wh one question that i can answer uh for that is someone will say like well doesn't it take a lot more time to sew those pieces together to create that piece of material and and the answer is yes but financially speaking on it that material is kind of written off and i've now created material for free all it's taken is my labor so the the, the time of my labor to put that piece of material together to make you know a, a meter half a meter squared which is all you need usually for say a bike bag or something outdoorsy um little bag outdoorsy bag sort of thing um the price of new material is most likely more expensive than what I would have charged for my labor to put that thing back together. So they end up pretty much even. And then by the time you do a little bit of material prep and maybe cleaning, if any pieces need to be wiped out dirt that's come off the floor, if they end up there, then it works out really, really even. So it, it's a great thing. You get a bag for pretty much the same price, um, except it's all in upcycled materials. And it's just taken a little bit more, uh, a little bit more labor, uh, a little bit more fiddly. But, you know, I love sewing. Uh, I love sewing these pieces together. I love seeing how these scraps can come together. Um, or, and as well, it, it gives, uh, I might contract out to a, to a friend to come in and just like, let's throw on some real good music. And let's just sew straight lines. Uh, here we go. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good fun. So that's, that's where those sort of pieces come together. And then, then they'll just become whatever the pattern dictates. Something that I love about what you do at Terra Rosa, Evan, is it doesn't seem like you are bound by any, uh, like any parameters of making gear. You're there for seemingly like what's going to be inspiring, what's going to be fun, what's going to be uh, interesting to make. And I kind of love that. Like you have such a dynamic. Like I don't think a lot of companies would just go out and make scrap gear because they would say. There's extra time there. It's not worth this. I'd like turn it into a formula or a spreadsheet that would say, well, this does not make sense for this reason. And you don't operate with those boundaries and be like, no, like this is awesome. Like I want to make something out of it. And it makes such cool stuff when you're able to branch out like that. And it seems like you, uh, instead of just being a gear maker, you're kind of fostering this MYOG environment, which is kind of gets to my next question. Um, but before I get to that question, yeah, like what do you – what would you have to say to that, I guess? It's not really a real question, but you just have such an open mind when it comes to making gear, which is really cool. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at making horrible business decisions. So <laughs> like that's, that's what it comes down to. No, it's, um, I, I, just, I just really – I have to work on things that inspire me, uh, and I need, like, constant inspiration and, and constant um, 
input of awesome uh, it was, is a cool thing. And, and luckily that's, that's pretty easy to achieve. Um, and I just, I just love seeing, well, when I hate seeing the waste, but then I love seeing what can be created from that. And yeah, it, it's going to take a little bit more time on those things, but that's all right. It's, it's a process, like I said, I love to do. So to keep that inspiration going uh, for me is, is just so easy on that sort of thing. And um, yeah, it's, I'm, I, I don't know how to do spreadsheets on, on that sort of thing. So um, yeah, if I saw some real numbers, I might say, oh, geez, that's really good. But um, that's, that's not in that that's not in the spirit of what I want to create there. And, and yeah, I just love kind of branching out, um, with, with that. And yeah, I, I, I find it just really inspiring and not knowing what it's going to look like in, in the end, uh, until, you know, sometimes the bag reveal or something, if you, when you turn the bags into like, wow, that has come out incredible. And like, I don't think they've ever, I don't think I've ever finished one and been like, wow, that looks terrible. Um, <laughs> It, it just doesn't happen. I, I, don't, I cannot remember a single time on the scrapped one um, at all. Yeah, far out. Yeah, no, it's it's very authentic. And like, I think that's something that people do appreciate about you. Like they don't, um, people don't shop at Terra Rosa because they want like this really like buttoned up, like, you know, collegial business style. They're like, no, like this guy's an artist and he's going to put together something unique. Um, so I think that's that's real to you. But yeah, uh, thank you. So talking about kind of the MYOG community side of things, tell us about some of the private workshops that you offer. Oh yeah, well that um, that was an idea that uh, well I think quite you know quite a few people um, kind of offer these around around the world. But it, just before COVID started, I was like, oh this will be great. Uh, let's do this. And then uh, you know COVID happened and uh, and the whole thing. And and if you if you know Melbourne had uh, some pretty severe lockdowns, so I was very restricted. Uh, in my access to the workshops and stuff. Um, but also at that time where my workshop was, was just in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, hard to get to, no public transit. Um, so I just ride my bike there or whatever. And that was, that was all right for me, but for someone else to get there as a, as a participant, not, not as great. Um, but I've now just moved my workshop into, um, into, into the inner city area of Melbourne. Uh, so it's a lot more accessible and, when um, you know all the COVID restrictions have ended here, and they they certainly politically I don't think could ever come back, um, it was like well let's start getting getting people back into the workshop, and this is uh, this is great, and yeah it's the the workshop like you said is is an eccentric and eclectic kind of mix of everything, so it's a, it's a fun place to kind of come in and and learn and um, hop straight onto some industrial machines right, and now. Um, learning on an industrial machine like if i could do my time again obviously i wouldn't change anything no worries but maybe i'd get an industrial pretty quickly and the the abilities that these things have and my love for them so like you know i could start going deep dives pull me back when i start going into the black hole sewing machines but like all of my machines are made in japan in the in the 1980s like great machines great quality parts great casting uh, great electronics, like these are great machines. Um, and then each one of them, except for, you know, maybe one or two here and there, they all have needle synchronization. So the needle will always end up in your work. So when you go to turn a corner, you know that the needle's always down. Um, they have auto thread cut. The thread does exactly what auto thread cut sounds like. Cuts a thread, boom, you don't need snips having hanging out everywhere. So to have somebody come in for a workshop and learn on these sort of machines, that have speed control as well, which is huge for, for someone that may not have ever sewn or was looking to get into something. Um, the machines can be intimidating because they're kind of roaring because they've all got clutch motors. Um, I haven't, uh, or they got, you know, clutch um, servo sort of style motors. So unfortunately, yeah, they're, they're power hungry, but we've, we've got solar, it's all good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to come in and, and learn on those machines, it's, I would actually love to do it again myself where I learned on, on that. but. You, you have what you are, the domestic machines that are available today, um, you know, yeah, learn them, get inspired on them, make some gear on them. And then if it's a journey that you want to invest a little bit more in, um, go, go down that. And in terms of investing for anyone that wants some advice, just keep your eye out on uh, Facebook marketplace and, and Gumtree and, and you can get great deals on sewing machine, on industrial sewing machines. And yeah, they'll take up a little bit of space, but if it's something you want and it's something you want to go for, they are amazing machines. So, yeah, people can come into the workshop, run these amazing, cool machines that uh, that do a very good job, and um, 
yeah, they can just start to, to learn the skills, learn that, uh, that MYOG, uh, MYOG journey uh, and kind of get inspired. So it's, we, we're starting off with just frame bags uh, for bicycles because, like I said, Melbourne's got a huge bicycling community. Um, and yeah, you can, they can ride in with their bikes. We measure up the bikes and they can choose the materials that are just here behind me and start cutting and sewing. And yeah, by the end of the day, you'll have a really, really cool bike bag. Uh, and I think I'll expand those or I'll take custom ideas as well. So we can do anything else on the bike or, uh, you know, probably do some ball caps coming up here pretty soon. Those are always fun. What's it like watching somebody sew for the first time, like learning, learning that skill? Oh, it's really, it's fun. It's so neat to see, you know, you, the first time you hit that pedal and the machine goes and pulls the, pulls the material a little bit and you might get a zigzag or one big, you know, um, hook off to the side. And then the next time it's, it's a little bit better. And then, you know, by the fifth or sixth time, you know, the best, uh, best little game that we play is you just write your name on a piece of paper in um, cursive handwriting or whatever, you know, where all the letters connect um, and then try and follow that with the machine. And then you learn how slowly the machine can go. And like you can go step by step with, with most of my machines. And then um, you can start to turn the corners. You turn corners easily because then, as you, like I said, the needle with needle sink is always plunged on corners. And then you all of a sudden you got the hang of what you're doing. And then you just throw in the technical ideas like, you know, add a seam allowance. And, you know, this is a pattern. How do you take two dimensional materials to then end up creating a 3D product? And, you know, all sorts of things like that. And, um, when you go step by step, it's all very simple sort of stuff. And by the end, you get a beautiful bag and they can be really proud of what they've, what they've made. And if it starts the journey, they can go and grab sewing machines down the road. It's, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. That sounds, that sounds awesome. We, uh, it's something that we'd like to do around here is teach everybody in the office how to sew. Um, it's, it takes quite a, it's a lot to ask on the guys that would do it, AKA the products team, Carter and Isaac. <laughs> so we haven't quite got around to it, but it, I imagine it'd be really cool. You know, we talked to uh, John from Alpine Luddites a couple episodes yeah. ago, and it was really cool to hear him talk about what it's like to, to teach people as well. And um, so I wanted to ask for your opinion, but uh, to, to that end, what's the DIY scene like in Australia? I mean, I would say in America, it's definitely growing, um, but it's not every day that you meet somebody like that. Or is it, commonplace does it take kind of is it far and few between what, what's it like down well there? yeah i think i might maybe have a slightly skewed view of it because i'm right in the thick of things um for sure but um you know the i think the outdoor community like i've mentioned here the bikers um the hikers the mountaineers you know these are people that would modify a lot of stuff anyway um and then just take it take it a few more steps it's like well instead of just you know, making a lanyard for my ice axe. It's like, I'm going to make a whole pack to hold the ice axe in a really cool way so I can get to it in one sweep, you know, something like that. Um, so I, I think like that ingenuity and stuff is, is always there. And um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the COVID lockdowns had a big, uh, big part in that sort of thing. Everyone's sitting there. What can I do? How can I keep occupied? Uh, and then if you're a certain type of mindset, which so, so many people are, then you can go down that like actual road of building things and, and trying things out like that. But yeah, it's certainly, certainly progressing. Uh, do you have any upcoming projects or product releases that you're excited about and want to share with the listeners? Um, what do I have? Well, um, well, a fun, fun one was um, I've joined the uh, Arc'teryx Australia team to help with their Rebird program. Uh, and it is really cool. So yeah, it's, it's neat to have such a, a big company um, with so much respect and, you know, just an icon of the outdoors with Arc'teryx. Um, yeah, kind of inviting on board there. And, and yeah, I'm getting a, getting a lot of... Um, really cool ideas and, um, you know, upcycling old jackets and old ski pants and backpacks that, uh, you know, that are end of life. It's so cool. Um, might have something here. Yeah. So there, there's, um, I was just on our work table here. That's a bit, it's a ball cool. cap. And that is an old, um, alpha AR, uh, I think, oh, sorry, beta AR. It was a beta AR jacket. Wow. Um, so that has just become a ball cap and oops. Uh, so yeah, it's an, an example. Awesome. Of, yeah, for for the listeners without video, I just put it on my head and it looks hilarious. <laughs> there it is. Um, so yeah, that's no. That. I mean, it looks super official. I can definitely see how you you upcycled it, but it also just looks like a hat that Arc 
Arcteryx would sell as well. For sure, so. yeah. Yeah, it's some cool stuff. <laughs> so that, that'll that be a fun journey. Um, that one's just beginning. And yeah, we'll, we'll get some really neat stuff uh, going through that over the next, um, next year or two here. Uh, in terms of other things I've been working on, I mean, there's things all in grabbing distance. Uh, just been re- reworking some of my bike packing bags. Um, so I've got a, uh, this is going to be one a feed bag that I've been working on, uh, for the, again, for the listener who doesn't have video, it's just a you know, pretty standard looking feed bag, except I've got some parabolic curves incorporated in the design. Ooh, so the, yeah, so there's some really nice. neat curved seams and then where I've padded it and stuff, it actually will then sit flat. Um, so yeah, it'll go nice and flat. So if you need to pack it away for a different part of the trip huh. or if it's not full, but you need to push it out of the way for knee space or, you know, uh, as your knees rotate around on the pedals and all that, then, um, yeah, it can. So uh, pretty big, this'll be the expedition one. Cause that's, that's a, that's a huge feedback. If you put two of those on your bike, you're, you're, you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of carrying ability. So yeah, just been redesigning that and happy with that. That'll be really coming out in the next little bit here, maybe in a week or two. Um, and then I've got, uh, what else is, uh, what else is kicking along here? Um, no, pretty, this is a sin bags, um, the a synthetic sleeping bag, really proud of that one. Again, there's some really cool curves and stuff into that. And, um, again, for, for my, how I participate in the outdoors, the synthetic, uh, is just perfect. So to have a really rad sleeping bag that can just be so thermal efficient and, uh, and then water res- water resistant, uh, in a sense. Um, moisture capable, uh, I suppose is a better, better way. Uh, then yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but no big releases coming out at the moment, just kind of waiting for some of the, uh, some of the cool materials that I've been hearing talk about. So, you know, those ones that, that changed the game, I, I, I hopefully, um, uh, challenge sailcloth might have something coming out. I'm not sure how much we're allowed to say or anything, but it might be very lightweight and very shelter orientated. Um, so that, that could be pretty cool to see what they can do with that. Um, and, um, yeah, some of those bonding, bonding materials, uh, but, uh, that, that's really neat for, for us smaller MYOG or style got people, um, who don't have seam sealing capabilities with the machines, the big heat sealing machines, being able to seal those seams, uh, by hand, although it's labor intensive and time, um, uh, time sucking, it's just so great to be able to produce something that's completely waterproof by the end of your project. If you could add one thing to the MYOG market or like the at-home market, so kind of include yourself, so maybe even a couple people, what would it be? Whether that's a fabric, a bonding device that you could Mm. have in your, I don't know, uh, uh, use your imagination. But um, we talk about this a lot, like Carter and Isaac, and I, well, at least I bother him all the time. Like, yeah, but imagine if we could do our own bonded stuff sack. Um, that, you know, and like, they're like, why, why do you think like that? Or, <laughs> but I don't know. What's that one thing for you that you were like, I just wish we had this at the home market readily available. Golly, good question. Um, yeah, seam sealing is a big one. I wish that there was something that could seal the seams on sill poly sill nylon that was quick and efficient and cost effective and not super um dirty uh, messy yeah <laughs> that would be cool because yes. yeah i know you can bond some stuff onto it these days but the machines you know using some ult- ultrasonic frequencies and some of the heat presses and stuff i just i don't have physical space in my workshop to to um you know invest in something like yeah. that and, and then go forward with it and then also to like use it you know a couple times a month on some tarps right um yeah, yeah, that would that would be cool if there was something really efficient like that would be very uh, would change the game because then you could um, you know basically bond an entire sill and nylon sill poly tarp sort of thing at home really easily without all the spe- yeah. super specialized machinery that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. Super cool, and like even s- some of the tarps that I've made will have like a center ridge line that you bind, which is really nice, mm-hmm. and like I've had really good success with that in terms of rain resistance and stuff, but bonding would also eliminate that weight that the grow yeah. you know, obviously creates as well, which would just be awesome. Fantastic. Well, a question back for you. When you bind your, um, your ridge lines, do you find that that works quite well? I, I used it a, a little bit, but um, 
uh, went away from it, not because of it was inefficient or heavy or anything like that. I just found that my lap seam, because I've got a double needle machine, so I can do a single pass lap seam, literally four pieces of fabric all wrapped up, um, was was more beneficial to me. But yeah, how do you find the um, the uh, bound seam? It's been good for me so far. I've used it four times, I believe. So it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have weeks of use at this yeah, point. Yeah, sure. Um, but, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just did like a basting stitch. So it's a it's a hammock tarp. I will also preface. Yep. Um, so it's a hammock With tarp. A cat so cut? it's like a 13-foot ridge line. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. I'll baste those two panels together and then bind it on top. Um, we've got like a binding attachment, so it makes it really quick and easy. I mean, that tarp, like despite being one of the biggest projects I've worked on, was also by far the easiest. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. With the binding attachment, you can just rip just right go, through. Yeah. Pedal <laughs> it's down awesome. and off you roll. Um, but yeah, no, it's been great. Both, I think all the times I used it, you know, being on the East Coast, a pretty wet side of the country, I think it's rained every single time I used it. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> it's been good. Well, 13 foot, you got, you, geez, you would build a house under there. <laughs> yeah pretty much fantastic <laughs> cool all right i'll have to i'll play with i'll play some more with some bound seams and see what i get yeah carter's also a good guy to uh to ask because he's made all of those and, and designed quite a lot of them um at least the tarp that i use specifically he he designed and it's his, it's his personal like hammock shelter cool. thing. so uh he's a great guy to pick pick brains with brains with but um so you're We've talked about how long you've been a company and how you've been able to develop kind of your own strategy for your business and how you work. We have a lot of cottage makers that listen and people that we have in our community. What sort of advice would you give to new cottage companies? Um, we call them kind of COVID babies around here, jokingly. That a lot of sewers have come out of the COVID there you era, go. Yeah. myself included. Yeah, cool. So what sort of advice would you have for the, uh, the, the, the COVID babies of the cottage? Yeah, I'll give it up. It's not worth it. Yeah, no, it's just... <laughs> give it away um obviously joking uh yeah i think just follow follow what feels right um yeah geez i feel i feel kind of out of place offering advice on something like this but um it depends on uh, i suppose on all sorts of things how, how your mind works and what you're what you're looking to achieve um personally my long-term goals are there and i have long-term goals but also um uh, yeah i just have to be flexible and um adapt to what happens right like you know five years ago ask me where i think i'd be now geez I, that that pandemic really changed that five years hasn't it so it's just a bit hard to look long term and but keeping it short term and achieving those little goals um are, is just so much more realistic for for myself and what i imagine somebody else starting out um w would look to achieve and um uh, and then may, i don't know if you want to get like the philosophical kind of answers or whatever maybe like seek seek out failure like, you know, make stuff until it breaks and then, you know, you, then you dial it back a little bit. So it's like, wow, that pretty much killed me. Let's take that back one, two steps here. Um, and yeah, just, just, just keep going. If it's something that you love and it's something that you want to go forward with, then I, I think you'll find the path to, to make that happen. And, uh, and then, yeah, Ripstop uh, obviously is, is real, real handy with, with helping along the, that path with, with those resources and those access to it. Cause like, you know, like I said earlier, I started full time about 2014. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that I even got my first entire roll of material. Um, but like in, in that time, it was still just ordered 10, 20 yards at a time, get it flipped over. Um, I mean, shipping was a lot easier and a lot or a lot better um, back in that day as well. But, um, you know, those sort of outlier variables aside um yeah it, it's pretty cool so yeah i think um i think the the, the covid babies or uh, you know these people that uh, that um are, are doing that i think it's fantastic and you know that that was just this the world's changed a heck of a lot and the the access to resources now uh physical and um uh digital uh have changed like tiktok and instagram and the way to get this your business visible uh is is a whole different ball game and i uh, yeah what i would have done to had that sort of stuff in 2012 um like yeah instagram was brand spanking new then and facebook was a whole different entity and tiktok's still a decade away and yeah it's um yeah it was pretty cool so yeah i think i think there's i think new startups have have a lot of a lot of really great things to to go and keep trying to press uh press forward with new things and and push those ideas um because anybody can start and do something that's the exact same as everybody else. But I think if you can 
maybe try pushing into new things and trying new experiments and seeing as these new materials come out and what can be done and what can't be done and and then sharing those sort of resources it, that's really really cool and yeah hopefully there's some amazing stuff come out of it i love that so we're probably going to wrap it up here so we don't keep you from working on all the projects that you have on your table. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but uh, Evan, where do people where do people find you? How can they look more into Terra Rosa and, and find awesome stuff? Yeah, you awesome. Thanks. Um, Ter- uh, Instagram's my go-to. Um, yeah, that's that's the one I'm active the most on. Then my website, Terra Rosa Gear, uh, keeping that as updated as I can. But uh, that's where you go through to actually like grab whatever you want. But yeah, feel free to message through on, on Instagram or um, even Facebook and I'll try to get back as uh, as quickly as I can. And that's any sort of thing, questions on sewing machines or, you know, how does this work? How does that work? Um, yeah, all that sort of stuff is, is great fun. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much that. But I'm, I've been trying the whole time here thinking about like a cool failure of my gear. Um, and I, I still, I, I mean, there's all sorts of little failures, you know, like, like I said, like tarps come down. You're like, oh, I can't be bothered picking that up. It's ridiculous. I'm just going to sleep through this. And then a rainstorm comes in. Um, but, oh, man, yeah. Because what I've tried to do is avoid the epic failure in the bush. Something like, you know, oh, my backpack strapped is I was doing a dynamic move on this exposed ridge line. Like, you know, I nearly fell. So I, I don't have any of those um, as such. But just like, um the, uh, you know what the fun ones were is testing out the Tyvek sleeping covers to see if I could actually call Tyvek uh, and this is the Tyvek that's 1443R so it's the soft structure stuff not the ground sheet um, home wrap to see if I could actually like comfortably call this a bivy material um, and and yeah I had some wet nights and so the answer is no Ty- Tyvek <laughs> can't be a bivy in my opinion um, but it's great as a cover. It's great to stop that wind. But oh man, yeah, there was some, some like oh, let's just jump in the water and then sleep wet and see what happens. And um, yeah, some shivery cold nights. But yeah, it, <laughs> the product testing. Got to make sure. Got to make sure. Evan, are you? Do you know who Kelly Cordes is? Kelly Cordes. Um, no, I don't think I recognize that name. So he, I don't, I don't personally know him, but there's this amazing video. He's a Patagonia product okay. tester. Um, and there's this hilarious video of him like jotting down notes on gear that he's testing. But it's it's hilarious because he's like, he jumps in a river or whatever. And then is wear, like wearing like the Patagonia puffy, the jacket. And then he gets out and he's like standing there in the snow. And he's like, I'm getting very cold. It's been 10 minutes. 15 minutes it's getting much colder <laughs> but i'm Love it. but i'm imagining you in the tyvek just like i'm very very wet an hour later i'm still quite wet <laughs> no no dryness just wetness misery increasing <laughs> yeah. that that sounds about right yeah yeah but Heaps um fun. yeah uh, evan you're awesome thank you so much for sharing this time with us oh, thanks, and with guys. the listeners it's been really fun to catch up with you i mean i've been following you uh, following you since i came to the company um so seeing a lot of stuff that that we've been sending you and working with you for a while so it's really cool to, to talk with you more or less face to face yeah um and uh yeah your insights are really valuable thank oh, you well, thanks thanks so much for having me and yeah thanks for everything you guys do and um yeah we'll uh, keep in touch maybe see you guys down here in melbourne sometime soon uh yeah, come for a come for a canyon, come for a bike ride. 